area upstairs is also down here. Minister Lin, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Um, it's good to see a full house today. I'm sure everyone's busy, whether you're based in Taiwan or flying in, are uh, busy with the inauguration after the weekend. Welcome to the panel discussion, Taiwan and the region under President Lai, co-hosted by the International Crisis Group, the, Asso the Association of Taiwan Journalists, and the Taiwan Foreign Correspondents Club, the TFCC. Uh, I'm Thompson, the uh, TFCC president and the moderator today, and uh, I'll quickly introduce our three event organize, uh, organizers today. The, uh, the crisis group, the ICG, is a policy-oriented advocacy organization focused on conflict prevention and conflict resolution. They have a network of a analysts around the world and publish comprehensive reports based on a research methodology that involves speaking to all conflict actors to come up with realistic and actionable policy recommendations towards preventing, managing, and resolving deadly conflict. The uh, ATJ, the Taiwan uh, Association of Taiwan Journalists, um, is founded in 1995. It has more than 300 members across Taiwan's media industry. The mission is to strive for press freedom, enhance professional standards, ensure the independence and autonomy of journalists, and fulfill the responsibility of news media as a public instrument for society. Um, and today we also welcome Will Yang um, from the ATJ, who has put in a lot of time to pull together this event. Um, he's a member of, of the Standing Executive Committee of the ATJ. Um, the TFCC, the Correspondence Club, is, um, is a is committed to promoting the professional interest of foreign journalists in Taiwan, and we regularly organize high-level briefings, discussions, and uh, networking events for correspondents and our members. So um, with that, we will now go on to um, briefly an overview about the event today. Um, Taiwan's new president, um, Lai Xingde, will play a significant role in determining how the country navigates cross-strait turbulence and a, fr uh, and a fragile status quo. As a key point of contention in the U.S.-China relationship, any tactical shifts around in the inauguration will carry implications for the broader region. Uh, today, we are joined by an esteemed foreign policy and defense experts from Taiwan, Japan, and the Philippines to discuss the political and security situation in and around the Taiwan Strait and how the unofficial relationships between Taiwan and key regional actors may evolve uh, after President Lai's inauguration. Uh, and so I'll introduce our panelists later, but right now uh, we want to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for, for today, uh, Lin Chongpin, the former Deputy Minister uh, for Defense in Taiwan. Um, so, uh, Minister Lin, welcome. Uh, Minister Lin is a professor emeritus at National Defense University in Taiwan. He served as Deputy Defense Minister in 2002 to 2004 and as Vice Chair of the Vice Minister of the Mainland Affairs Council, the China Facing Ministry, uh, between 1996 and 2001 in Taiwan. Um, in DC, he was the Sun Yat-sen Chair at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute before that. Uh, Minister Lin has a PhD in government from Georgetown University, an MBA from UCLA, and a BA in geology from National Taiwan University. So uh, without further ado, let's give Minister Lin a round of applause and welcome him on stage. Minister Lin. A crisis in the Taiwan Straits is likely in 2024. That is what more than half of US and Taiwanese experts said at the CSIS Power Project in late January this year, following the election of Lai Ching De as Taiwan's next president. To stimulate our discussion, 
let me play devil's advocate by submitting to you four factors which suggest to me that war will spare the Taiwan Straits. Number one is Lai ching malleability. With his potentials for making pragmatic adjustments to avoid war with China, back in 2017, as mayor of Tainan, Lai said we should be friendly toward China and love Taiwan. Three years later, as premier, he described his, himself as a pragmatic worker for Taiwanese independence and advocated a posture he char characterized as to defy China and protect Taiwan. Still later, on January 1, 2023, as vice president, he concurred with President Tsai Ing-wen's statement of pursuing peace and protecting Taiwan a posture he reiterated in response to the Financial Times reporting. Uh, actually, the journalist is right here. <laughs> that lie sparks concerns over China tensions. In August 2023, for the first time, Lai adopted President Tsai's formulation of the Republic of China on Taiwan rather than just Taiwan and indicated that he would continue to do so in the future. While Lai had long refrained from campaigning at Taoist Buddhist temples, he showed new signs of malleability by diligently visiting such locations while busily signing his portrait photos for the voters, which began in March last year. As a medical student, Lai was inspired to enter politics by a speech delivered by a DPP founder at Chenggong University in Tainan, who emerged as key mentor of the young Lai. This mentor reportedly has been on good terms with both Beijing and Washington. Thus, despite Lai's public image as Taiwan independence firebrand, he is not totally insulated from the great power dynamics between the United States and China. Factor number two, Biden's China guardrail and Trump's dislike for war fighting. <clears throat> In November 2022, <clears throat> excuse me, Biden and Xi Jinping met in Bali, Indonesia. Since then, Washington has been actively establishing channels with Beijing with key aim of avoiding accidental military conflict with China over Taiwan. Why? U.S. war games conducted since 2019 showed a military conflict with China would result in either a Pyrrhic victory or outright defeat. This prompted alarm in Washington and a renewed urgency to avoid war. Since then, Biden's freedom of movement has been further constrained by the ongoing Ukraine-Russia war and the spreading conflict in the Middle East. That explains why AIT Chairwoman Laura Rosenberg's six visits to Taipei within a year seeking to prevent a flare-up in the Taiwan Straits in the run-up to the Taiwanese presidential election and inauguration. Once inaugurated, President Lai most certainly will avoid provoking China with moves towards Taiwanese independence. Come November, what if Donald Trump wins the U.S. election. His trademark propensity for deal-making over military crusade suggests he would not allow Taiwan to provoke Beijing. Number three is the Chinese culture of strategic aversion to war fighting. From 1949 to 1979, China waged six wars across its borders. Since then, not one. How come? During the former period of 30 years, China was poor, backward, and struggling, and prone to war fighting. In the following 45 years, as China began to rise, it has become war aversive. It's drawn in stark contrast. Since 1979, the US has waged 18 foreign wars, 
followed by the Soviet Union and Russian Federation with 16. Despite this obvious disparity and divergence in national behavior, the US military establishment has increasingly projected its own thinking on Beijing, with at least five generals and admirals warning since 2021 a Chinese attack on Taiwan by 2027. Over the past few decades, Beijing has sought to keep Taiwan in its orbit using non-military instruments, such as economic, cultural, diplomatic, psychological measures on the front, supported by the backbone of growing military might. In my 1988 book, China's Nuclear Weapon Strategy, I coined the term extra military emphasis, which predates and contains the now increasingly popular term gray zone. Another key element of China's Taiwan strategy is the non-bloody, non-destructive, or non-kinetic naval and air exercises in the waters and airspace around Taiwan. In 2003, PLA General Zhao Xijun coined the term borderline deterrence. During the 1995 to 1996 Taiwan Strait crisis, Zhao was deputy commander of the second artillery or missile force. Since 2016, the increased frequency, variety, and proximity of China's military exercises near Taiwan are a continuation of this doctrine of pushing the containment envelope without breaking it. The result is mounting psychological pressure on Taiwan for Beijing, that suffices. No war fighting with irreparable aftermath is required. Number four is Xi Jinping's quiet policy overhaul following the 20th Party Congress to which a war on Taiwan would be counterproductive. In Beijing's foreign affairs, the wolf warrior approach is gradually giving way to a renewed charm offensive. In domestic policy, private enterprises which were previously suppressed have enjoyed a comeback. In Taiwan policy, we see a fine tuning of Xi's formerly self-contradictory and rough-edged two-handed Taiwan campaign. Formerly, Xi had called for matching of heart and soul across the Taiwan Straits, while simultaneously warning of earth moving and mountains shaking if Taiwan refuses unification. The net result was repulsion toward and rejection of China among the young Taiwanese who will be our future. Today, this strategy has shifted to a soft hand, which actively engages a broad cross-section of Taiwanese society, which Beijing believes comprises the majority of the voters as distinct from the ruling party DPP. The hard hand challenges the DPP administration in territorial jurisdictions and international space, but with minimized fanfare and the non-renunciation of the use of force, which Beijing used to remind the Taiwanese, has been muted. The revised approach includes all-out invitations of Taiwanese social groups to be heartily entertained on the mainland. They include the neighborhood officials, the youth groups, the veterans, and etc. Taiwanese college students invited by mainland counterparts for a two-week summer visit were even offered future jobs after their graduation by prestigious mainland corporations. Lifting of trade restrictions on Taiwan's agricultural products to win goodwill among Taiwan's rural communities. New restrictions on Taiwan government's territorial authority in the Taiwan Strait, such as flight routes 
and jurisdictions on waters, particularly near Jinmen for now. Increased frequency and proximity of fighter sorties over waters near Taiwan. Basically, under Xi's new foreign policy and domestic agenda, military conflict across Taiwan Straits runs counter to Beijing's renewed charm offensive to the West and economic revival at home. All of these, I'm sorry, as these four factors reinforce each other, war will spare the Taiwan Straits. Thank you. Do I um, thank you. Thank you, Minister Lin, um, for the keynote speech. Um, I think now we'll invite on stage our four panelists today. So uh, could we now welcome them on stage and uh, sit with us. Oh, and uh, also we have uh, the transcript of uh, Minister Lin's speech. So if anyone wants a copy after the event, please feel free to get in touch. Um, now we'll quickly introduce um, our panelists, distinguished uh, panel today. On my far, far right, um, all the way down is uh, uh, Tetsuo Kotani. Kotani-san is a professor at Meika University and a senior fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. His research focus is Japan's foreign and security policy, the U.S.-Japan alliance, and international relations and maritime security in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, in, he, he also won the 2003 Japanese Defense Minister Prize. Um, and on Kotani-san's left, beside him, is uh, Amanda, Amanda Xiao. Amanda is a crisis group senior analyst for China. She focuses on conflicts in which China plays an important role and developments in China's foreign policy that relate to conflict prevention and resolution. Uh, and on, uh, beside Amanda is uh, Dr. Chen Mingqi. Um, Dr. Chen is the chief executive officer, the CEO at the Institute for National Defense and Security Research, the INDSR. Uh, before that, Dr. Chen served as senior advisor at the National Security Council in Taiwan. And last but not least, um, beside um, Dr. Chen is uh, Charmaine, Dr. Charmaine uh, Misa Lucha. She's an associate professor in the Department of International Studies at De La Salle University in Manila, the Philippines. Uh, she's also a fellow at Agora Strategy and a senior editor of Asian Politics and Policy at Wiley. So uh, with that, I would now move on to ask uh, our panelists um, some of the questions. So maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Chen. Um, Dr. Chen, what are the biggest political and security challenges that has faced Taiwan in the last few years and that may face Taiwan after the inauguration? Well, the... Uh, uh the biggest uh, security challenge for Taiwan in the past few years uh, is very obvious. China, uh, coming from China, uh, is an uh, uh, alternate between the soft hand, as to, uh, to echo uh, uh, Dr. Lin's uh, 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 opening remark, uh, alternate between the uh, soft hand and the hard hand. But mostly, I think, in the past few years, it has been the, uh, uh, the hard hand has uh, attacked the upper hand. Uh, and uh, military uh, pressure. Uh, I think uh, we all, uh, in many conversations, we all lament the uh, missing opportunity for the uh, 2016 inauguration speech by uh, President Tsai Ing-wen, uh, which mentioned is uh, uh, took a position that uh, that was very close to China's claim. Unfortunately, that uh, uh, in the we we receive uh, information that uh, that speech was welcome uh, in the morning, but uh, in the afternoon they seem to change the attitude. And since then, they set a tone to uh, for their Taiwan policy, and uh, that is to that was to uh, corner uh, the uh, ruling party and uh, try to attract. Uh, the member of the uh, society and uh, the opposition party. I think that remained so, but only intensified uh, during the, in the aftermath of the Pelosi's visit uh, and uh, the uh, military exercise uh, around uh, uh, Taiwan, no matter it's on, uh, on waters or the, uh, in the airspace. The daily incursion of our ADIZ and uh, gradually 
uh, even the uh, 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 pushing toward the uh, approaching the uh, medium line and sometimes uh, stay there for a very long time. It's almost a daily practice now. So this is a challenge that we face in the past few years. And I don't see that uh, even though, uh, as uh, Dr. Lin mentioned, that China seems to have an overhaul of its uh, for, uh, previous policy. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence that uh, they had a change. But uh, at the same time, a soft hand, uh, they, uh, the, uh, uh, because of the new dynamics in our parliament, and uh, China begin to see some opportunity there. So they try to attract uh, some of our politicians to visit China, try to divide uh, from within our society, and uh, try to uh, 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 you know, pose more challenge uh, to uh, the incoming President Lai's uh, 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 policy. Uh, no matter it's about defense reform, about the close trade relations, or the uh, uh, diplomatic uh, policies. So that was uh, uh, the uh, basic uh, uh, challenge that we have fi faced in the past few years. And uh, uh, you know, admittedly, that had put a lot of pressure on us. And especially, I think, uh, also, on top of this, it's about the, uh, you know, China is so good at the uh, uh, disinformation campaign and the divide our society from within. We used to saw that after some for our movement that uh, Taiwan's uh, youth have a, a you know a, a general awareness of the China threat, and uh, with the decline of Chinese economy, that China was no longer deemed as the uh, possible uh, destination for their future. Uh, but you know the uh, with the disinformation campaign, that seems to be not the uh, case, and uh, uh, they have uh, as a uh, uh, Dr. Lin just mentioned that uh, have to uh, attract our young people and the promising their future jobs in, in China. Even though China is facing the uh, record high uh, youth uh, un unemployment rate. So I think it's an all out effort, but also signifying that uh, China tried to use every uh, possible measures uh, short of the uh, kinetic warfare uh, to uh, approach Taiwan uh, to achieve their political goal. I think that remains the uh, mem uh, goal for China. Uh, and also, let's not forget about the uh, now, with the new uh, security environment uh, emerge, the uh, war in Ukraine, the war in Middle East, that give an opportunity for uh, China, uh, Russia, North Korea and uh, the, uh, the Iran to sort of team up, if not uh, in a very official term, but uh, in tactic, they are supporting each other. So that we now see that uh, that is a, a, a big challenge, uh, but also since that uh, the authoritarian ruler of the world have teamed up together, they sort of uh, uh, open up a, a new opportunity uh, for Taiwan. We used to be like, you know, fighting Alone, uh, uh, Dr. Lin has uh, in the, uh, been in this area for a long time, uh, serving as the uh, in the uh, either in Manning Affairs Council or in the, our Defense Department. I think that is uh, very obvious. Uh, we are sort of uh, uh, you know fighting this uh, alone, uh, try to protect, uh, maintain the uh, uh, status quo and the peace and stability in this region. But uh, with the new uh, uh, security situation, we have seen the uh, uh, rising awareness of not only the uh, uh, threat posed by uh, uh, authoritarian China, but also the authoritarian ruler around the world. So that opened up an, another opportunity uh, for us. So I would say in the coming uh, few years that uh, we, have, we will be seeing uh, coexistence of opportunity and challenge uh, down the road. But, uh, you know, under the pressure uh, from China, it takes a lot of strategic patience uh, to maintain the peace and stability in this region. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the, pre the incoming president, uh, Lai, will maintain this uh, uh, very difficult uh, uh, but very important uh, measure uh, but I think China will not forgo any opportunity to challenge 
uh, this uh, strategic patient. So I think uh, it's very important for uh, the incoming President Lai and uh, his uh, security team to uh, maintain that kind of uh, uh, strategic patient down the road. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen. Just now you mentioned um, there are both opportunities and challenges for Taiwan um, arising from the recent shifts in the region environment, such as growing cooperation between China and a few other authoritarian countries. Um, could I build on, I mean, looking beyond that, um, how do you see um, in this region today, we have uh, two speakers from the Philippines and Japan with us. How do you see Taiwan's relationships with Japan and the Philippines evolving uh, under a new administration? Oh, you know, we, we see, especially with Japan, uh, in the past few years, we have seen that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, security environment has uh, drawn uh, Taiwan and, and, uh, and Japan closer and closer. And uh, it's an uh, uh, um, unprecedented uh, opportunity for Taiwan and Japan to share, not only to share our uh, strategic perspective and uh, uh, how we see this region, but also many other uh, 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 cooperation, short of uh, military to military. We assume this uh, possibility uh, open up, uh, I think, first uh, Japan took the uh, initiative by uh, the former, uh, the late uh, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, hoping the opportunity to talk about, frame this as, uh, you know, the Taiwan contingency is also a Japan contingency. Uh, we are, uh, you know, serving at the INDS, uh, we have seen that uh, we, we uh, have a lot of uh, war game uh, with, uh, with uh, Japan about the uh, Taiwan contingency. We identify those uh, uh, weakness in our uh, uh, cooperation and try to come up with a very effective uh, measure to address those uh, uh, weakness. Uh, with Philippines, I think the recent change of the administration also pose a, a, a very good opportunity. I just finished a visit to uh, to uh, Philippines and the visit uni University de La Sa. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience that uh, we have witnessed the uh, warming up of this uh, uh, relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the Philippines. It's uh, very crucial uh, for Taiwan uh, to uh, uh, help each other to maintain the peace stability and so broaden our view. Uh, it's not only about the Taiwan Strait contingencies over the Taiwan Strait, but also we have to extend uh, also to the uh, uh, West uh, Philippine Sea. Uh, I think this uh, uh, three area, the uh, East China Sea, Taiwan Strait, and the, uh, uh, the so-called the uh, South China Sea, uh, have a strong internal linkage. So we probably have to be uh, on the same page, compare our note, share our view. And uh, that is happening now. And uh, uh, especially, I'm glad that to see uh, Taiwan's Coast Guard uh, have a very good working relationship with, uh, with the Philippines uh, Coast Guard. According to some uh, news report that we are going to have some uh, uh, joint action uh, uh, over the uh, water territory that we share. I think that is quite encouraging. But let's not forget uh, this all happened under the leadership of the United States. So United States play a very important role in building this uh, 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 a coalition to uh, sort of the face the, uh, rea the security situation in uh, an environment in this area. Uh, many, you know, many conversations at INDSR or beyond uh, will finish at the uh, last question, what if uh, in, the, uh, in November uh, there will be another change of the administration in the, uh, uh, in, in the U.S.? I think that is a, a very big challenge for us. With the uh, United States decide to withdraw, whether this uh, good uh, relationship with the, the Japan, with the Philippines will uh, maintain, remain the same, that is a highly uh, 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 questionable uh, for us. For, so for now, I think uh, the uh, Taiwan's security community try to make uh, this two bilateral, First, we want to make, make them uh, multilateral, 
at least a trilateral, and uh, make our relationship uh, resilient, if that is key word for the new uh, uh, government, uh, resilient of any change in the uh, leadership change in the United States. Uh, There's a very big challenge, and uh, I think our uh, adversary will not uh, let go of this opportunity, try to alienate uh, Taiwan's already very uh, good uh, relationship with Japan or with the Philippines. Especially, I would point out that uh, uh, in Philippines, the change of their uh, 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 defense posture uh, toward China is uh, something relatively new and uh, face a lot of uh, domestic uh, challenges. And uh, we like to uh, help uh, our friend to uh, uh, shoulder uh, uh, together the, uh, uh, the responsibility to maintain the peace and stability in this region. It's, after all, I mean, it's so important not only for uh, three of us, but have uh, implication uh, further beyond uh, these three countries. I think it's also very important to China, as uh, Dr. Lin mentioned, that in the past 45 years, China has uh, taken the uh, uh, opportunity to develop the relative uh, peace, uh, peaceful uh, uh, security environment in this region. It's a benefit of China a lot. But unfortunately, China sort of seems to have a, a different thought about this situation. We used to warn our allies a lot about the uh, China's ambition goes way beyond Taiwan. I think it's a global. They have a global ambition. It's not only about the so-called uh, unification with Taiwan. Uh, finally, I think uh, that kind of a warning has uh, uh, been heeded uh, by many capitals around the world. That has made uh, our uh, situation uh, uh, better and make our work uh, a little bit easier. Though we are busy building the uh, coalition, uh, that is also not thing that we should devote. So I think uh, uh, for the, uh, 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 the incoming president line, is going to inaugurate this, uh, the coming uh, next Monday. I think the big challenge is that uh, how to make the, uh, our relationship robust and resilient and uh, prepare for the uh, uh, very different uh, situation uh, next year a and uh, facing the uh, uh, you know, uh, never-ending challenge from, from China. I think that is a how to take the advantage of this uh, uh, security environment and uh, sort of uh, we have to uh, rush against time and to make our relationship more resilient. I think that is a big challenge for President Lai. I think uh, 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 President uh, Tsai has done an a, a, a excellent job in, in doing this. So on the one hand, you have a strategic patient. On the other hand, there is very proactive uh, uh, coalition building. So this uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a combination, this is a mix is, uh, is uh, so important to, uh, to, for Taiwan's uh, 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 you know, effort to uh, maintain the status quo. I, I see this is uh, uh, the quintessential uh, challenge and also the uh, uh, obligation and uh, uh, effort that uh, the incoming president Lai should uh, devote to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, I mean, you mentioned, you talked about um, China and U.S. at length, so maybe I would um, next ask Amanda on, uh, Amanda, what effect has the November summit between President Xi and Biden had on the rising tensions over Taiwan? Great. Thanks, Thompson. Um, and hello to everybody. Thank you for uh, coming out here, I know everyone is extremely busy on the eve of the inauguration. Thank you particularly to Dr. Chen and Minister Ling. Um, and thank you to everybody. Um, so U.S. tensions, U.S.-China tensions over Taiwan have decreased, driven in large part by an interim understanding that was reached last November at the San Francisco summit between Xi and Biden. Um, of course, the root causes of friction remain, the positions of uh, the U.S., China, and Taiwan remain very far apart, um, and the U.S. and China continue uh, to engage in a struggle over Taiwan, but in this period, that struggle is taking place at a lower volume. Um, 
let me get into some of the specifics of why I think the tensions have lowered, um, and, and then we can talk a little bit about how long we think this will last, perhaps. Um, in the lead up to and following Taiwan's presidential elections, the US sent a number of signals that were meant to reassure Beijing that Washington has no intention to change the status quo. Following the election, for example, President Biden himself said publicly that the U.S. does not support Taiwan's independence. Now, this is the U.S.'s long-standing position, of course, but it was significant that it was said by the president himself um, at that particular moment. Um, let me move to China during the last couple of months. Um, we've heard from Minister Ling about some of the calibrations that have been uh, underway, and um, let me... Um, let me say as well that I think that since the elect, uh, Taiwan's elections, there has been a calibration in China's approach. Um, it's common, and we've already started to talk about this, uh, but China's approach uh, to Taiwan has both soft and hard elements, or a carrot stick approach. Um, and not to mangle the metaphor too much, um, but one way we can understand China's approach is that I think during this period, China has been using a smaller, but perhaps a sharper stick, uh, and beginning to dangle some carrots, but it's not really clear how much those carrots are gonna cost and whether they might be spoiled, okay? So, so on the pressure side of things, you know, China has maintained you know, pressures on Taiwan, but it has kept those pressures under a lower threshold, um, because it does not want to give the U.S. reason to intervene, and it's trying to appear, appear less provocative. Okay? So in many ways, let me just talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of Chinese pressures in the last couple of months. Um, one, we've seen that it's opportunistic. Uh, in response to the law enforcement incident around Jingmen, Beijing responded very opportunistically, using the incident to end their you know, a recognition of restricted and prohibited waters around the Jingmen Islands, and in doing so, China ended a long-standing norm in the Taiwan Strait. Um, another characteristic is that Beijing's pressures, I think, have become maybe harder to respond to because they are technically within the rules. Now, Beijing, for instance, engineered the ending of diplomatic relations between Taiwan and Nauru in response to the elections, Technically, it is Nauru's sovereign right, right to make that decision. Uh, Beijing shifted airline routes um, in the Taiwan Strait unilaterally. Technically, they are allowed to make that, de that decision. It is frowned upon that they did not consult with relevant parties, but technically, they are allowed to do so. And as well, law enforcement patrols around Jimin are technically taking place in China's exclusive economic zone, and so therefore it's technically not illegal. Okay? So it is harder to respond to because there's less of a legal basis for Taiwan's response, but also the broader international community's response. So there's a new dilemma perhaps at play right now for Taiwan. Um, and the last point is that I think um, there's been a greater focus on, I mean, there's always been a focus on undermining Taiwan's sovereignty, but um, I think that's um, more evident um, with some of these pressures that we're talking about. So again, these pressures are meant to squeeze Taiwan's international space and to challenge Taiwan's jurisdiction um, from all a variety of fronts. Um, but at the same time, there have also been some soft elements to Beijing's approach, and these are the potentially spoiled and costly carrots that I'm talking about. Um, so following Taiwan's elections, China's narrative downplayed the results, right? They said that the results show that the DPP does not represent Taiwan's mainstream um, in reference to the fact that President-elect Lai received 40% of the votes. Now, since then, much of China's narrative has been to signal confidence that they have control over the Taiwan issue issue, that their approach towards Taiwan is working because there remain actors in Taiwan that they can work with. And this rhetoric is, I think, largely intended to justify for an internal audience that peaceful unification with Taiwan remains viable. So it has also created some space for Beijing to shift away from a purely stick-heavy approach. 
So what are some of these carrots? Um, there are some indications of China being open to increasing cross-strait exchanges and cooperation, but the extent of Beijing's sincerity needs to be verified. And as Dr. Chen just alluded to, of course, some of these carrots also have the uh, added effect of potentially creating societal divisions or uh, deepening them in Taiwan. So specifically, in Xi's remarks during his meeting with former President Ma Zhou, he talked about China and Taiwan belonging to one larger Chinese nation and the importance of promoting youth exchange. The overall tenor of that speech was less political than usual and focused more on the cultural and historical linkages between China and Taiwan. Um, Following the recent, there was a KMT delegation that visited Beijing recently. Following that trip, um, the delegation announced that Beijing was ready to open group tourism, but within an extremely limited scope between just Fujian province and Mazu. And they sent an additional signal that they might be open to more group tourism if Taiwan meets certain artificial conditions. Okay. Um, so those are some of the examples of some of the carrots that Beijing might be signaling right now. But again, we, um, Taiwan would need to verify the sincerity of those carrots. Um, and just to close, to say that, of course, during this period, the U.S. has continued to demonstrate its support to Taiwan. There's been transits to the, through the Taiwan Strait. The military assistance bill finally passed Congress. There's support to Taiwan's participation in the World Health Assembly. Um, so to, just to sort of wrap up, the US and China continue to engage in a struggle, but during this period, at least, it seems to be taking place at a lower volume. Um, thank you, Amanda. You, you mentioned that the, um, the tensions have reduced a bit following the, uh, the summit last year. How long do you think, how long do you think the lowering, lowering of temperature the summit achieved will last, and uh, how, might the, uh, how might the U.S. elections affect cross-strait and regional dynamics? Yeah, so I think to answer that question, we maybe want to take a step back and look at some of the factors that produced an improvement in the U.S.-China relationship um, in the first place. So what, what is it that the two major powers saw as in their interest for um, stabilizing the relationship? So I, I see at least two. Um, both sides, uh, to put it simply, have other pressing issues that need, they need to attend to. So um, for Washington, that includes these presidential elections. Of course, the Biden administration is um, in full campaign mode. Um, but of course, there's other things happening around the world that are rather large, including in the Middle East and, of course, the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. Now, for China, um, I think a big focus for the leadership is their economic situation. Um, we've mentioned this already, but unemployment rates are high. Um, domestic and foreign investor confidence is um, low. Domestic consumption remains low. Um, the leadership doesn't seem to, um, so far, want to take um, more than modest policies to try to stimulate the economy. A lot of foreign capital has left. And um, there is a lot going on there. The Chinese leadership is trying to re-engineer their economy so that it, uh, future growth is not dependent on traditional sources of growth. Okay, and so we're in a period in which the leadership, I think, remains confident that they can achieve this. But in the meantime, the population is going to be feeling the effects of this attempt at a transition to a new model. And so as long as there is slow economic growth, um, that can be felt by the Chinese people, there's going to be some domestic pressure on China to demonstrate that it's trying to improve the economy. Um, some of that including um, improving its foreign relations and wooing foreign governments and businesses. Um, the, the leadership is, uh, they're convening the third plenum in July, so that's something uh, to watch. Um, so those are, those are um, some of the interests at play that um, led to the improvement in the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, just to say, 
as well that I think both sides saw an interest because they understood that 2024 was going to be a particularly turbulent year filled with uncertainties and political transitions. Right? So recall that prior to the Woodside Summit, the relationship had really reached a very low point. Um, and both sides understood that if they didn't inject a little bit of political capital back into the relationship and entered into 2024, in which we had not only Taiwan's presidential elections, but the big one, the US presidential elections, that um, the relationship could really, really bottom out. So I think that was a key motivation um, as well. Um, so, um, so again, all of that is to sort of say that the you know understandings between the U.S. and China are holding, and I think they'll hold until at least the U.S. presidential elections. But after the elections, there's still the possibility that the relationship will deteriorate once more. Um, uh, I'll maybe wrap this up quickly because I think we're going a bit over time. But in short, um, in the last couple of months, Washington has really been increasing its pressure on China in a variety of ways. And Beijing's unhappiness with that now may manifest later in 2025. Um, there's been a variety of pressures in the economic and tech and security realms, um, but we saw that when um, Blinken went to China, the response out of China was relatively measured. Um, and the signal was that we still want to maintain the progress that was achieved out of the November summit. Um, now, that's not to say that China is happy with what's happening right now. Uh, that's simply to say that they are, um, I think, uh, they want to see what comes out of the elections first uh, before they take any action. Okay, so, um, and just quickly on Biden and Trump, I, mean, I think Dr. Chen already covered it, but just briefly, of course, the U.S. will maintain a competitive posture vis-a-vis -vis China, regardless of who wins. Um, the difference is maybe that competition will be within limits under Biden and will therefore be more predictable for China. So this includes around Taiwan, where the two sides are beginning to understand more clearly the other side's no-go zones. Um, and competition will take place through a more managed process if it's under the Biden administration. So um, here I'm referring to the dialogues that have been set up since Woodside between the two militaries. Um, the, I think the AI dialogue just uh, started to take place. Um, and there's ongoing discussions between the trade and commerce departments, right? With Trump, the outcomes are much more uncertain. The range of possibilities is much broader. Um, you know, economically, Trump might go after a broader set of imports from China, though I have to say the Biden administration in, rec in recent days have really um, made an effort to make sure that um, the American people understand that they too are willing to impose tariffs on China. Um, but so, uh, you know, r recall that under the Trump administration, there was an agreement around the phase one agreement that has been unfulfilled. Um, so he could easily come in and point to that uh, agreement and say, hey, China, you haven't fulfilled your um, promises under the phase one agreement. On security issues, I think there's a really big question mark over Taiwan. Um, you know, it doesn't seem that he is particularly himself interested in Taiwan and, you know, seems to see the island as a bargaining chip, but his advisors might see the issue differently. All right. And as Dr. Chen mentioned, Trump is skeptical of America's alliances and um, whether Washington is getting enough out of them. And so America's approach to its foreign policy will likely be much less multilateral, including in its approach towards Taiwan. Um, but so uh, the short of it is in 2025, U.S.-China tensions may significantly increase in either scenario, whether it's Biden or Trump. Um, and if that does, the possibility that tensions will play out over Taiwan um, may emerge again. Thank you, Amanda. Um, one quick note. You, just now you explained um, what Beijing and D.C. have been trying to achieve. So um, I just want to turn the attention back to Taipei, where we are. Uh, to what extent will the words and actions of the new Taiwan administration affect the U.S.-China relations? Um, so, so much of the cross-strait dynamic depends on the U.S. dynamic, as I was trying to um, suggest. But of course, what the Lai administration says and does still matters. Taiwan has agency and should seek to exercise its agency to the extent that it can. 
Um, the new administration is already sending goodwill gestures, um, including showing interest in reopening dialogue with Beijing. These are positive, these should continue. Given the uncertainties that might emerge following the U.S. presidential elections and the gestures that Beijing is making towards increasing exchanges right now, there may be an opportunity, a slim one, to improve the atmosphere in the cross-strait relationship. I think a resumption of cross-strait dialogue is unlikely, but increased communications at the functional levels is not impossible. Um, and here I'm talking about the existence of 20 plus cooperation agreements between the two sides of the strait. So in areas like law enforcement, economic issues, customs, et cetera. Um, also around the Jimin incident, working level discussions were taking place in Jimin. The resumption of group tourism may be possible and perhaps eventually the exchange of students. These wouldn't fundamentally change the cross streets um, you know, relationship, but it could improve the environment and the tone of the relationship. But of course, this will very much depend on Beijing's willingness to re-engage um, at both levels. And here we go back to this uh, sort of carrots metaphor, right? Um, but the new administration can continue to send goodwill gestures and to test Beijing's sincerity, um, particularly in the, I think, early part of um, President Lai's um, administration. Thank you. Um, and I think with that, we'll now turn to uh, Kotani-san, um, our speaker today um, from Japan. Um, Kotani-san, can, can I ask you, um, how have tensions on Taiwan in recent years shaped perceptions and discourse inside Japan about its own security environment and how are Japanese interests affected by what's going on in Taiwan? Well, thanks, Thompson, and, uh, and I also like to thank the conference organizer for uh, inviting me. This is my first visit since uh, COVID, and I think over the past four years, J Japanese perception on Taiwan and the uh, situation surrounding the Taiwan Strait uh, has changed uh, a lot. But be before answering the question, let me uh, say something. Uh, last, uh, yesterday, my, my American mentor, uh, Dr. Jim Awa, uh, A-U-E-R, passed away. Uh, you may not know him, but uh, he was a, a U.S. Naval officer, and he was a, a Japan desk officer at the Pentagon during the Reagan administration, uh, otherwise in the Mr. Armitage and uh, he was uh, a scholar at the Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. And he was a close friend of uh, Prime Minister Abe, and he was a close friend of uh, President uh, Li Tanhui. And his uh, lifelong brief was the, the U.S.-Japan-Taiwan security cooperation is the key to the peace and stability in East Asia. Um, so uh, I, I learned a lot from him, uh, but I'm very sad that he passed away. So please uh, pray for him. And answering the question, um, in April uh, 2021, then uh, Japanese Prime Minister Suga visited White House uh, as the first uh, guest to, uh, of uh, President, Bi uh, President Biden, and they discussed the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait for the first time in 50 years. And then the two governments studied the, the coordination and the preparation for a possible Taiwan contingency uh, scenario. And reportedly, the two governments have, uh, have already uh, come up with an uh, initial phase of a joint operational plan. Uh, and then followed by Prime Minister Abe's uh, statement that uh, Taiwan contingency could become a Japan contingency. I actually hosted the event with the Taiwan's uh, Prospect Foundation in December uh, 21, and then uh, Prime Minister Abe was the uh, keynote, and then in his remarks he, he said uh, so. And then uh, in uh, the, the Russia studied the full scale of invasion of Ukraine in February uh, 22, and the Prime Minister Kishida stated Ukraine today could become uh, East Asia tomorrow. Um, so uh, 
Taiwan contingency could become Japan contingency is not the official stance of Japanese government yet. And I, I don't think the Japanese government would say so officially because it is too much uh, provocative uh, to Beijing. But uh, I understand every Japanese policymaker and uh, every uh, Japan, Japan security community, uh, a community member understands that way. And, and uh, uh, Japanese government adopted the new national security strategy in December 22. And under this strategy, we are now increasing our defense spending, uh, uh, almost doubling our defense spending. And also we are introducing the longer range uh, missiles both anti-ship and, and anti-ground. And I would say these new uh, measures by Japanese government is part of the efforts to prepare and deter uh, the Chinese aggression against uh, Taiwan. So over the past four years, Japan's policy uh, toward Taiwan and toward the Taiwan Strait uh, uh, dramatically changed. And not only on the policy level, Japanese uh, general public's perception also changed. So when uh, Prime Minister uh, Suga and President Biden announced the importance of the peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, uh, the 70% of the Japanese uh, general public supported uh, this idea. And, and since then, the Japanese uh, uh, general public uh, is showing their concern about uh, possible involvement into the Taiwan Strait crisis. Uh, according to the recent uh, public opinion poll, 70% uh, or 80, even 80% 80 of the Japanese people think the uh, Taiwan uh, contingency scenario could become a reality w within a few years. Um, and this uh, threat perception is kind of endorsing the, the change of Japanese official uh, policies. Um, before the uh, Prime Minister Abe's statement of the uh, 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 Taiwan contingency could, could become a Japan contingency, only 20% of the Japanese general public supported the idea of increasing the defense spending or in introducing the longer range uh, strike capabilities, because uh, most of the Jap Japanese people thought uh, that that was not necessary and that was too much provocative against China. But after the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the number uh, 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 rose up to the 55 percent. So now a majority of Japanese uh, general public supports the new uh, Japan's new uh, uh, security policy, including the uh, doubling the defense spending and introducing the, the longer range strike capabilities. So I would say the, the Japan as a whole is very much uh, willing to play a greater role to preserve uh, peace and uh, security across the Taiwan Strait, not only with the United States, but also with the international community, and, and of course, uh, with, with Taiwan. So uh, every time the Japanese Prime Minister meets the world leaders, they uh, uh, make a statement that, uh, about the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. And what uh, Japan hopes is the, the international community would send a unified uh, message to the Chinese leadership uh, that uh, the use of force against Taiwan is un uh, unacceptable. Um, so by doing so, we are trying to uh, eliminate the, the possibility that the Chinese leadership will miscalculate and, and must misperceive the situation, uh, and then they, they believe that they could uh, invade Taiwan. Um, that said, however, let me say, let me um, emphasize something. Um, so over the past four years, as we change our official policy, uh, sometimes we, I hear uh, Americans or Taiwanese uh, expecting Japan will send the self-defense forces to, to Taiwan 
to defend Taiwan. Uh, I would say that's not going to happen. Even if there's an a invasion of Taiwan, Japan's primary role would be defending itself, defending the southwestern island chain uh, uh, from where the U.S. military will initiate operations. And uh, un unless we defend our southwestern island chain, China might take some of the key islands in the southwestern island chain, and they would use it, use them as a forward base to dis disrupt the U.S. operations. So uh, we believe our primary role uh, in a possible Taiwan contingency scenario would be defending ourselves. And by doing so, we can indirectly contribute to the security uh, of Taiwan. Can I follow up by asking um, specifically on Taiwan, how, like looking ahead with um, President-elect Lai taking over from Monday onwards, how do you see the uh, Taiwan-Japan relations going forward under uh, a new administration? And what balance should Japan strike between its relations with um, China and the US when considering how to calibrate all these together with, with the Taiwan relations? So I, I would say the Japanese government is very much welcoming in the incoming uh, President Lai's administration here in Taipei. And uh, uh, we will continue to seek the expansion of uh, possible uh, cooperation. Uh, even if the, uh, there would be a continue to be a political uh, limitation uh, uh, under the J Japan's One China uh, policy. Um, so I, I think there, there are several uh, areas for cooperation, for further cooperation between Japan and Taiwan. The number one would be the intelligence. Um, we, we, we have to share intelligence, particularly about the PLA activities uh, around Taiwan and around the southwestern island chain. Uh, so far, there's no official mechanism for Taiwan and Japan to share the inf uh, information and intelligence. But I think uh, we, we have to uh, come up with a certain way to do so. Uh, one possible way is we share uh, the information and intelligence through the United States if, uh, if the direct uh, sharing uh, is impossible. Um, but uh, unless we, we work on this in, in intelligence sharing, we, we cannot uh, better prepare uh, for a possible uh, uh, scenario, uh, in, uh, invasion scenario. And the, uh, likewise, I, I think we, we should further enhance our cybersecurity cooperation. A um, cu couple of years ago, I, I learned that, uh, actually the Japan and, and Taiwan were closely working on the cyber issues, but mainly for cyber crimes rather than cyber defense. Um, but I, I think it's now uh, to upgrade our cyber cooperation from the responding to the cyber crimes up to the, to the cyber uh, defense. And because cyber cooperation is uh, I invisible, so in some sense that's, uh, uh, that's easier to, to start. And another issue uh, I, I would I'd say is the, the response to um, the, the, the information uh, campaign by Beijing. Um, there's a, there's a, China's information operation uh, is a common challenge for both Japan and Taiwan. Um, so we, we can share our, our uh, intelligence and we can share our best practices so that we can uh, better shape the information <laughs> domain. Uh, otherwise, the, uh, China can uh, influence the, the domestic uh, uh, argument about the security. Uh, and, that, that, uh, and if so, that is uh, uh, very much negative on our uh, defense policy. So uh, I think the information uh, domain could be the, uh, the new area for the cooperation between Japan and Taiwan. 
And the another possible area is the defense uh, uh, industrial cooperation. Um, as the war in Ukraine showed, uh, it is very important to maintain uh, or, or sustain the defense production capabilities. Um, and uh, democratic uh, communities should further enhance the defense industrial uh, cooperation so that we can provide and share our weapons and ammunition. And just recently, the Japanese government decided to uh, lift uh, some of the uh, uh, um, uh, limitations on our arms export. So um, it, it is not so easy to, to do our arms export cooperation with Taiwan immediately. But I, I think uh, there should be uh, some room for, for maneuver so that we can uh, start the defense industrial uh, cooperation. Um, so, so, uh, so I'll stop here. Um, Charmaine. Um, Charmaine, I mean, similarly, um, for the Philippines, there's in many ways there are similarities with Japan, how it's part of the region and it feels it's affected by what's going on in, in this country. Um, how are Fi Philippines' interests affected by what we've seen happening in Taiwan? And uh, how have rising tensions in this area affected discourse and perceptions uh, in the Philippines regarding its own security? Thanks so much, uh, Thompson. Good morning, everybody. It's such a privilege to be joining this panel um, with such distinguished speakers and to also engage um, in a conversation and share some insights with you. To answer uh, your, your question, the Philippines is acutely aware of cross-strait tensions, not least because of the mounting pressures from, from China um, on both countries. As we speak, the, um, China continues to occupy features and islands in the West Philippine Sea. And in the last year alone, we've seen an increase in China's gray zone operations in the West Philippine Sea and in um, the, the, the Philippines. Um, we, we've seen incidents from laser pointing to uh, firing water cannons, um, harassing our uh, fisher folks, to also ensuring that the resupply missions to our uh, one of our ships um, is, is, is always disrupted. So we've, we've, we've seen a steady increase in those kinds of operations. And then inland, we've also seen an increase in China's cognitive coercion, uh, meaning to say there are now a lot of um, information, misinformation, disinformation campaigns going around, particularly in social media. Um, and there have also been reports that, that the Philippines is very much entrenched in uh, social media use. So it's very easy for different types of narratives, pro-Chinese narratives, to be circulating all over the Philippines. That being said, the perceptions of, um, of Filipinos about Taiwan, about our security environment, are largely driven by the foreign policy direction of the sitting president. And for this, I, I can give two very specific examples, drawing from the last two administrations that we've had. From 2016, to 2022, during the administration of President Rodrigo Duterte, his foreign policy was a definitive shift or pivot towards China. During those years, we've seen the downplaying of Chinese actions in the West Philippine Sea um, and biases really towards China. Um, there, there have been, um, uh, well, the rationale behind this, this policy is that moving closer to China or in ensuring closer, a closer bilateral relationship with China, guaranteed support for President Duterte's now infamous and notorious drug war, but at the same time, it also gave President Duterte the much needed support for his flagship infrastructure program. Um, that, that's one example of how our perceptions are largely driven by the sitting president. The second example that I can give is based on the current administration of President Marcos, who's been in power since 2022. 
In contrast to Duterte, Marcos pursues a more robust foreign policy. Um, he is still operating under the concept of a quote unquote an independent foreign policy, but his definition of an independent foreign policy is one where we diversify our international relations. So since sitting in since becoming president, he has really been able to leverage our um, alliance with the United States. He's moved closer to partners. Um, um, around the world. Um, and in regard to Taiwan, Marcus's congratulatory message to President Lai indicates that the Philippines now sees Taiwan with, a, uh, now sees Taiwan with strategic value. Many observers um, highlighted that this congra congratulate, congratulatory message meant that Marcos crossed the, you know, the quote unquote, the red line. Um, but for many Filipinos, this is an indication that we now see Taiwan um, as a more important partner considering what is happening in, in the West Philippine Sea. Um, in, from, a, from a geopolitical perspective, Taiwan is now seen more as a flashpoint, which is why Marcos is engaging in um, what we now call a strategic balancing with, with the United States. On the economic front, um, there is now growing recognition of the um, deepening cooperation with Taiwan um, under the framework of the um, New Southbound policy. And then at the, at the heart of it all, President Marcos is also ensuring that our people-to-people -people relations, um, a people-centered approach um, is something that, that we can pursue um, in the long term. So in short, the perceptions really of the Philippines is shaped by the sitting president. But despite, despite that, there's also growing concern on the ground or growing recognition on the ground that the Philippines and Taiwan have shared um, interests. Our informal relations have expanded exponentially over the past several years. There's now ever more growing recognition of our shared values, recognition of our uh, growing economic complementarity. Um, and all of this despite mounting pressure from China, which then leads us to a conclusion that what is badly needed is increased coordination between the Philippines and Taiwan on um, multiple fronts. You spoke just now, you, you, you touched upon the, um, how um, the Filipino president congratulated President-elect Lai and uh, how that shows that the Philippines values Taiwan as a strategic, um, uh, has strategic value for the Philippines. Um, can I sort of build on that and ask you how you see, um, similar to what I asked Katani San before, how do you see unofficial relations between the two countries moving forward under a new president, President Lai, from Monday onwards? And how should the Philippines navigate the um, tricky relationship with both China and the U.S. and how Taiwan falls into all these? Because the Philippines recognizes that whatever it does with the United States would, imp would have an impact on, ha on its bilateral relationship with, with China. In the same way, you know, whatever it does with China has an impact on Taiwan and also in its alliance with the United States. So what the Philippines should really do, and this despite changes in administration, the Philippines really ought to pursue a prudent and sober policy, foreign policy. Um, we are oftentimes criticized by, um, by the fact that we have oscillating foreign policies depending on, our, on the sitting president, but it is very important for the Philippines to project itself as a, um, as a, as a responsible member of the international community by pursuing prudent and sober foreign policies. In regard to um, um, how, the, how I see the Philippine-Taiwan relationship evolving under President Lai, I would echo our, our Japanese Japanese speaker in looking at the areas of cooperation that he identified, but in particular, I also would like to highlight that we, um, that the two countries should continue whatever gains they have been able to, um, um, that have been made under the um, umbrella of the NSP. This means improving economic cooperation, um, improving cultural relations, um, and also to the Philippines 
really has much to learn from, from the Taiwanese blueprint on combating disinformation and, and misinformation. The Philippines has fallen into this trap of, of information operations, especially during the uh, administration of President Duterte. So we have much to learn from, from Taiwan as to how to fight and combat all of these um, information operations. Thank you. Um, open to questions from the audience. Um, I think we would take two or three in one go and then let the speakers, let the panelists answer. So if you want to ask a question, either in Chinese or English, please raise your hand um, and uh, tell us your name and your affiliation and keep it short. Um, Green. Hi, <clears throat> G-Man. Um, I'm a member of TFCC and also a member of INDSR. Um, <clears throat> my uh, question is, um, uh, the pressure that uh, President-elect uh, Lai will uh, be under in terms of quote-unquote maintaining the status quo um, is unique because China is not maintaining its status quo. So how does the world expect Taiwan to maintain the status quo if China has changed the status quo? Thank you. Thank you. So one question about the status quo. Um, anyone else? Um, yeah, can you use Chinese to ask because we have translation. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Brian. Um, I'm Xu Tian from uh, with Taishi Media. And uh, actually, I would like to uh, uh, hear more about uh, Mr. Lin's uh, response and comment to our great panelists. Because uh, uh, during the slide talk before the session, uh, I remember that Mr. Minister Lin told me that uh, according to his observation, uh, after the, the, the 20 con party congress uh, of the CPC, actually he noticed that Beijing has already uh, trying to change the course uh, in dealing with the periphery uh, issues, including Taiwan, Philippines, Vietnam, and their ties with Europe. So, uh, of course, uh, this uh, trajectory or this observation are, uh, could be a quite interesting comparison between the information provided by, by our panelists. So, I, I would be very glad to hear more from the Minister Ling about his uh, commentary. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, we'll take one more. Um, the lady in yellow. Yeah, Sally, sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, Sally, Sally Ensign from Taiwan Plus. Um, I would like to ask if any of you have noted any kind of apprehension uh, from policymakers or leaders in the region uh, towards President Lai uh, because of his previous comments or remarks, you know, as a pragmatic work of uh, Taiwan independence, um, or even earlier, you know, there have been some apprehension uh, towards him as more perhaps deep green than President Tsai. Uh, does he seem like a more risky ally uh, than Tsai? Or is uh, everyone kind of in the region pretty confident that he will just continue her legacy, um, you know, in carrying forward the status quo as it is? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. I think, I think we have two questions now. So I'll leave it to the panelists to answer. One is about Given that China wants to change the status quo, how does, uh, how does, why does the world expect Taiwan to uphold the status quo? And the second is apprehension uh, from leaders and policymakers within the region um, regarding the president-elect, uh, particularly his, um, particularly his uh, independence, quote-unquote, credentials. Um, Dr. Chen, do you want to start first? And maybe then I will ask Amanda to weigh in. His question regarding the status quo, yes. Well, uh, our effort in the past few years have been uh, uh, maintaining the status quo and the peace and stability in this region. And it's become very difficult. And uh, as China tried to push the envelope and to the, to the, to the extreme. Uh, that's why I mentioned that the strategic patience is very important and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, cooperation understanding from our allies is also very important. Our allies, including both within the region or beyond. I think this is uh, something that uh, 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 have to uh, put together so as to, uh, you know, maintaining the status quo is also always our commitment, uh, Taiwanese government. I mean, uh, in different uh, uh, administration, no matter it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's from Kuomintang or from DTP, DPP. However, it's a highly dynamic, given the uh, 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 defense posture, as well as many other majors, uh, short of the uh, kinetic uh, warfare. 
I think uh, they, they, they tend to, they, they, they mean to change the status quo. They, they, and at least uh, to a Taiwan, the, uh, China's uh, 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 very uh, uh, clear uh, goal is to achieve the unification or what we, what we think as uh, an, exception, an exception of a Taiwan. I think that is uh, very obvious. Uh, but however, for us, Taiwan, that uh, we define the status quo as the, uh, the ROC Taiwan and the PRC doesn't uh, subjugate each other. So that is, uh, even though that we have set the bar very low, the status quo, but uh, they try to they try push in. And um, they have uh, uh, intentionally break uh, the many device that is uh, conducive to uh, maintaining the status quo, including the medium line. I think the, uh, the result of the, uh, the M503 uh, and uh, what happened in Jinmen, I think they will use every opportunity to challenge the status quo. And it takes a lot of uh, uh, strategic patience from our side and a lot of uh, 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 effort from our ally uh, so as to maintain the status quo. For example, after the uh, 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 Pelosi's visit, uh, I think uh, we remain uh, very, uh, 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 first, we have to be very firm about our uh, defense of our uh, sovereignty and uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, do a lot of scrambling and uh, pushback of this uh, China's uh, aggression. Uh, but though we remain very low key in this, and I think uh, with, uh, especially with the United States, while I was working at the NSC, uh, we uh, both sides understand the importance of uh, public messaging. So that is uh, some, uh, 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 something that uh, both sides, uh, China, well, no, so, uh, Taiwan and the US have invested a lot in this uh, public messaging. So, you know, US has not particularly strong is in its uh, reaction. Uh, admittedly, that has uh, drawn many disappointment in this region. But I think we uh, cooperate because that, uh, we believe that uh, our uh, uh, bilateral relationship with the U.S. is uh, what it uh, uh, takes to maintain the status quo. Uh, but I think it takes uh, uh, a lot. Uh, I think probably if, if, if we can, uh, we, we, will, we will wish that the U.S. had been more assertive in its uh, reaction and the Taiwan and uh, in, have a trust in the Taiwan's leadership to maintain, uh, you know, uh, its commitment to the status quo. We, we have no intent to, to challenge the status quo. That includes that the many people worry about President Lai's uh, 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 policy uh, toward China and his, uh, his attitude to uh, the very touchy uh, so-called Taiwan independence issue. I think uh, my understanding is that uh, we are going to remain uh, uh, you know, a strong defender of the status quo and uh, we will try to exercise constraint and uh, not to be the uh, party that is uh, too provocative in this area. But in return, we expect more assertive action from our allies, including United States, Japan, Philippines. And that is the, you know, we, we are not the uh, single uh, actor in, in this. I think uh, uh, you, we all have to invest in, uh, in the, uh, uh, the uh, status quo across the Taiwan Strait, but not only Taiwan Strait, including the West Philippine Sea, in the East China Sea, I think we are interconnected, and uh, we all have stake in the uh, in maintaining the status quo. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, Amanda, do you have any um, comments? <clears throat> yeah, just to say that um, I think it's clear in recent years that Beijing has become very impatient with the status quo. Um, its attitude has changed. Its capabilities have risen. Um, it's increasingly, it's made remarks to the effect of the status quo cannot be permanent, right? And the status quo is very hard to define. And actually, it's, the three parties have never fully agreed on what that status quo really means, 
right? Um, and so, you know, just, I think, just bear with me for a second, but in my sort of visual understanding of the status quo, it's not like a single point that all three parties have ever converged on. It's really like a plane that, you know, serves as a boundary for all the possibilities of what status quo means. And each side can sort of take their own interpretation of what it means. And that ambiguity has served um, cross street peace well for decades. But as you suggest, one of the parties is, um, you know, showing signs that they are not increasingly unhappy with the status quo. Um, I think for Taiwan to, you know, maybe be a bit reductionist about it, there's, you know, sort of two simple things, not so simple, very complicated things that Taiwan can do. One is to maintain um, the uh, continuity as this uh, incoming administration has campaigned on to continue the, um, you know, responsible and moderate uh, cross strait policy of the Thai administration, including um, her characterizations of what the cross strait relationship is. But on the other hand, Taiwan also needs to signal more clearly to China the costs of potential aggression. And here we're talking about defense reform. Okay. Um, you know, a lot, uh, Dr. Chen can speak more to this, but um, the Thai administration um, took uh, positive steps in this direction, but a lot more has to be done for Taiwan to really embrace um, an optimal defense strategy. I think there remains considerable debate within um, Taiwan's policy elite communities within society of what exactly is the threat from China and how do we respond to it. And that debate um, has implications for defense reform. I don't think there's a full consensus around what the best strategy is and how best to get there. So, you know, on the one hand, it would be maintain the cross-strait policy of the Thai administration and how you talk about the cross-strait relationship, but on the other hand, you really need to be moving much faster on defense reform. Um, thank you. Given the new dynamics in the parliament, I, I think that would be very challenging. In the past few years that uh, we invest and we build and we ally, uh, that's because that, uh, the ruling party have the majority in the Congress. And uh, no longer the case uh, now. So I think uh, our lie should invest more in the uh, communication, our policy communication with our own people. Uh, we used to be like, you know, for example, during the uh, conscript reform, uh, 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 President Tsai has prepared. But oh, there is only one front, that is uh, the public opinion. But now that uh, similar uh, uh, reform might, met, uh, might, might, might meet uh, a lot of resistance uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from our LOI. I, I think that is a new dynamics. Although that uh, according to our internal poll, uh, majority of Taiwanese people uh, will be, uh, 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 think that uh, we push the uh, defense budget share of our GDP to the 3% uh, point is acceptable. I think that is our goal, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, will the, uh, the LOI agree to that. Uh, that is important. And uh, uh, a lot of things that is uh, going on, uh, uh, we're in progress, including uh, strengthening our training. I, I think, the, in, in, you know, in the past, we have been focusing too much on the, uh, on the uh, acquisition of the uh, weapon. I think uh, going down the road, I think, uh, uh, and I think that it's uh, only internal. That doesn't require cooperation from the LOI. That is a strength in our training. And uh, uh, to sort of uh, uh, make our soldiers and general understand the uh, modern warfare. After all, we haven't really uh, uh, been uh, in a war for so long. Uh, that's first. Second is the uh, middle challenge, uh, everything short of kinetic warfare. That include the, uh, uh, you know, the possible scenario of blockade or quarantine. I think that is something can be done. Uh, and without the, uh, 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 you know, effort from the LOI to, to do that. There might be some disturbance, but uh, I expect that uh, there's some area 
and the uh, Lai administration will uh, continue, continue to invest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yeah, in green, gentleman in green. Thank you for this very interesting panel. My question is more towards Taiwan uh, and uh, Japan. Uh, my name is Philip Nubel. I'm with Global Voices, and it regards actually Russia. Uh, if you see uh, Taiwan and Japan cooperating more and controlling certain exports uh, towards Russia, either directly or indirectly, as we've seen, and in general also how Japan might be pivoting on its relations uh, with Russia and also regarding the Northern Territories. Thank you. Um, anyone, any more questions? If not, I would turn towards, um, oh, yeah, there you go. Yes, hello, I'm Florence de Changy. I'm a reporter with uh, Le Monde. Um, my question is actually back to the South China Sea uh, and this um, status quo, which is not defined. I am very, very surprised of what happened after 2014, 2014 to 2016, when we've seen China de facto uh, militarizing several of these small uh, islands. Um, and now it is a de facto thing. No one can imagine that uh, even the US will be able to say, you shouldn't be here. You should destroy all these massive buildings uh, landing fields, etc., that have been built. And this is clearly, it's not the Taiwan status quo, but it was a regional kind of status quo that has just been accepted. So it really looks like China is pushing step by step, steadily. Each time it can grab something, it does. And then there is no return. So claiming that with respecting the status quo, but actually no one really does, and the U.S. doesn't seem to really stand for it, because they could have stopped that, could have stopped all these thousands of sand barges going there to build these islands, and they didn't. So could you comment on this? Thank you. Thank you. I think the first question would go to Kotani-san, and then the South China said maybe to Shemaine. Yeah, Kotani-san, yeah. So Japan's relationship with Russia totally changed after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Before that, Prime Minister Abe was very much willing to work with Putin to resolve the territorial issues over the Northern Territories and also to conclude the, the, uh, the peace uh, treaty with Russia. Um, but what uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine showed was Prime Minister Abe's approach was wrong. Um, and now uh, that, that's kind of a consensus uh, inside Tokyo. And of course, um, from, from purely economic or energy point of view, we still uh, need a cooperation with Russia. But the, the uh, issue now here is the, whether or not we will pre preserve the rules-based international order or not. And Russia clearly violated the, the UN Charter and, and invaded the neighboring country. So um, we, this is totally unacceptable from the Japanese p point of view. Um, so uh, at least uh, as, long, as long as the invasion continues, uh, there's no voice inside Tokyo that we should resume talks with, with Russia for energy cooperation or economic cooperation. Uh, and, and majority of Japanese now believe that we should uh, uh, make any, every effort to, to defeat uh, uh, Putin's Russia. Certainly from a Philippine, Filipino perspective, the militarization of the South China Sea is also very, very alarming. But there are at least three things that um, I can identify that um, the region should do. Number one, um, members of, of, of ASEAN and other uh, entities in, in Southeast Asia um, hopefully would be able to support explicitly the 2016 Arbitration Award. 
Um, and I understand very well that this also very much depends on how the Philippines leverages the arbitration award. Um, and many observers have indicated that we have missed the boat, so to speak, because of um, President Duterte during the Duterte years. Uh, but that's one thing, to, su to explicitly support the 2016 arbitration award in all um, platforms in the international community. Second, we can also strengthen mill-to-mill -mill cooperation. Um, the, the Philippines annually holds the Balikatan exercises with the United States, and recently we've also had trilateral military exercises with Japan, Australia, and other like-minded partners. Um, strengthening mill-to-mill -mill cooperation is very useful, especially for a country like the Philippines who has yet to complete the modernization of its armed forces. But to complement that, the third thing that um, I can identify we should do is also to strengthen civil maritime security programs. Um, this goes at the heart of um, quote unquote human security. I understand human security is a very contested concept in international relations, but what I mean here would be to um, um, in, in, to, to have initiatives in regard to protecting the ecosystem, the marine ecosystem, um, protect coastal communities, um, and, and um, essentially look at the applications of maritime domain awareness. Um, yeah, Will. Uh, my name is Will. Uh, I'm from ATJ. I'm upstairs. Um, because no one asked question in Chinese, maybe I will ask this question in Chinese. Uh, I would like to ask the question for the Mr. Kotani. Because之前台湾跟美国,像是众议院议长他们有来台湾参访,那不晓得在未来就是赖清德总统上任之后,日本方面是不是有可能有比较高层级的官员来到台湾做一个互动,或者是台湾比较高层级的官员有可能会到日
to turn it on. Yeah. Schoberg, Alexander Schoberg from Berlinske Danish uh, newspaper. Uh, you you all seem to um, to to care quite a lot about the U.S. election in November. So do we all, I guess. Uh, so I'm wondering, what's the worst case scenario if Trump gets elected? And I'm serious here because this is what we all are waiting for, right? So, 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 and you're all nodding. So, so what, what is it specifically you're so afraid of? I'd like to know that. Okay, so now we have two questions and Catherine Hiller. My name is Catherine Hiller. I'm with the Financial Times. Um, I have a question for Charmaine. Um, I was wondering if you could, us, uh, could give us a flavor of how the discussion in the Philippines is evolving around more concrete uh, features of if, a, a conflict over Taiwan, like, uh, for example, um, whether or not it, the U.S. should be allowed to use the Edgar sites uh, f to do certain things, like what about uh, taking in fuel, what about um, aircraft maintenance, what about, well, more offensive things and, and uh, um, pre-deploying uh, missiles and, and whatnot. So, uh, I've heard about uh, this a fair bit last year, but I'm not sure like where things have gone from there. Thank you. Um, so we have three questions here. Um, Dr. Chen, do you want to take the first one about uh, Li Pa Yuan? And then Amanda, maybe about uh, Trump, potential scenarios of Trump. And I'll leave to Shemaine for the last one. Well, for for LOI, I mean, we are a democracy. We can not do much. Uh, well, China intend to divide, uh, you, uh, uh, fully uh, uh, utilize the uh, so-called divided government and uh, the difference of uh, uh, policy toward China uh, from the executive branch and the uh, legislature uh, branch. So I uh, only can uh, we say, you know, please, uh, I, I think uh, it takes a lot of uh, political maneuvering from the, uh, from the president and from the administration so that uh, we are basically uh, on the same stand uh, toward China. Uh, that is very important. Otherwise, as you mentioned, that, uh, that probably will send a very confusing signal to our uh, like by partner, whether we are uh, 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 very, uh, uh, you know, very firm about our own national defense and uh, we are uh, going to continue our defense uh, uh, reform. Uh, you know, sending the uh, very uh, mixed message will not help us to uh, enlist the uh, effort uh, from our uh, regional allies in this, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to reach our common goal. So, but I, I see no, you know, it doesn't really bode that well uh, from the beginning of this uh, uh, new LOI that in the dynamics. Uh, China tried to, you know, alert some people to Beijing. The only thing is that, okay, uh, maybe China is still see there's some hope there uh, to achieve the, uh, their goal, or the political goal, with the, uh, with the uh, non-kinetic uh, major and uh, that we can work on that. We can uh, uh, try to bring the uh, opposition party on board uh, so as to uh, tell them, persuade them that uh, our national defense is uh, very critical, very important. We can have a different opinion on our domestic uh, policies, but uh, we should remain the same in uh, uh, maintaining the status quo. Thank but you. I, I would think that is a lot of effort. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I must have misunderstood, I misunderstood the lady's questions earlier. I think she's trying to ask maybe Kutani-san can answer how does Japan or the Philippines see the, uh, the, the uh, more of China-leaning um, actions and behavior by, by law, some lawmakers in, in the Taiwanese legislature? Well, so before the election, uh, of course, we were concerned about uh, who will win. Um, and as a result, um, although the DPP got the presidency, but uh, the parliament was divided. Um, but all the three uh, presidential candidates, of course, their positions were different, but they are uh, uh, status quo uh, 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 f figures. So in some sense, Japan was very much uh, relieved to see the three uh, candidates talking about the status quo. Uh, of course, there should be some the difference of nuances. Um, 
so we may hear uh, different opinions from uh, different parties, but uh, we understand the Taiwan as a whole is seeking the status quo. So uh, I think Japan will continue to work with, uh, willing to work with uh, Taiwan, uh, whatever uh, who leads the country. And uh, uh, so uh, I think the Taiwanese people don't, don't have to worry about the Japanese negative uh, reaction uh, to your domestic uh, political situation. And let me uh, answer the question about the Trump. Um, I, I've, been, I've been following the uh, Trump administration, uh, Trump, Trump's policies. And I, I would say the worst case scenario uh, would be that Trump uh, is defeated again and does not accept the defeat and try to seek the election in 2028. Um, that would be the worst case scenario uh, because Trump will continue to divide and, and disrupt the US uh, politics. And then uh, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran would, would see uh, some opportunity to take uh, and, and uh, 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 they could, they might think they could change their status quo. Um, so, and if Trump is re-elected this year, I, I don't think we have to worry too much uh, because we, we witnessed what happened during the first term. Um, overall, uh, on, particularly on security issues, uh, for allies and friends, that was okay. Uh, China, I mean, Trump became uh, competitive against uh, China, which no previous administration since Nixon uh, was willing to. But I think uh, Trump's uh, policy on strategic competition was right. Otherwise, China could be more arrogant and aggressive against uh, neighboring countries. Uh, look at the Middle East. Uh, Trump uh, uh, led the Abraham Accord, and even the Biden administration is following that. So, so Trump is un, un, unpredictable, but overall his uh, policy um, direction uh, is, is good for the allies and friends. Um, on, on, in January, uh, 2021, before Trump left the office, the Trump administration declassified the strategic framework for the Indo-Pacific, uh, in which uh, the, uh, in the, the, the documents clearly stated the United States would defend the first island chain, including Taiwan. And I think this will be the, the policy under the Trump uh, version two. And this is something I, I hear from the uh, Trump's foreign policy advisors today. Um, I think what Kotani san is, said is correct. I think um, maybe just to add to that, I, I think that frictions with the U.S. W will certainly rise. Um, but something that's interesting about the Trump administration years is that because he was so unpredictable, America's deterrent effect on China, I think, grew as well. In that, because Beijing had a very hard time predicting what Trump's next move would be, um, there are indications that they took a more cautious stance. And in some cases, even engaged with the US in ways that they hadn't before, because there was a lot of anxiety. But the flip side of that is, um, there was a point at the height of the pandemic in around October uh, 2020, um, in the lead up to the elections in 2020, that a consensus was forming in Beijing that the US was preparing a strike on one of the Spratly Islands and reefs that China holds. Okay, there, was, there was rumors that went around in Beijing of an October surprise. And the logic went that um, out of a hope of holding on to his presidency, 
Trump could um, make a big move in order to shore up his support at home. Now, this, I don't think, was actually in, uh, in the works. But the point here is that that unpredictability goes both ways in terms of China. There's a heightened possibility of misreading by Beijing. So they could be deterred or um, a Trump administration could push Beijing towards very deep uh, anxiety to the point where they may lash out. Okay, so just to, just to add to that, um, not a clear answer, but um, that's, that's sort of the world we're facing right now. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, now to Shemaine about um, the, uh, the Philippines. Um, let, me, let me also try to address uh, Trump's return and the question about domestic politics. Um, it's not just in Taiwan that also has you know, elements or components that are more leaning towards China in the Philippines. We also have um, you know, um, policymakers who are a little bit more sympathetic to, to the plight of China. So in, in, in that sense, Trump's return is bad, but what would be the worst case scenario for the Philippines is a return of the Duterte family into um, Philippine politics in the next round of, of elections, not just into the presidency, but also in the Congress and, and in the Senate. Um, so that would be kind of like a double whammy, so to speak, for, for the Philippines. To answer Catherine's question on um, the, the Taiwan uh, contingency, um, the first priority of the Philippines would, of course, be to bring all the overseas Filipino workers back home. Um, but um, and, and it, it's, it's also very, very interesting how narratives have really circulated um, during the Duterte administration vis-a-vis -vis the narratives that are, the discourses that are circulating today, because during the Duterte administration, nobody actually spoke about Taiwan. Um, even, even, even in terms of bringing the overseas Filipino workers back home, it's practically just not discussed at all. Um, but um, in, in today's configurations, there are more and more discourses and conversations happening about Taiwan. Not so much really in terms of the EDCA sites, but more in terms of what are the logistical implications of having to bring the Filipinos back home. And in case of an invasion of, of Taiwan, how do we ensure that our HADR operations remain smooth? Um, we are a little bit um, on the fence about the development of the new EDCA sites because while the identification is good, we have yet to see any real development on these new EDCA sites. We're thinking that this has to do with the November elections that are coming up. Maybe things are still up in the air because, we don't, because both sides don't know yet how to move forward. So it's a wait and see kind of situation. I seen uh, just now you were asking something to Minister Lin, right? Do you mind re repeating our question? So I will give it to Minister Lin to answer. Yeah, of course. I, I just want to hear more about uh, Mr. Lin's uh, overall commentary and response to our panel today. Yeah, especially when uh, when it comes to China's um, grand strategy in the next phase. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Minister Lin. Would you like to give a brief comment on uh, on, on the gentleman's question? Unlike Deng Xiaoping, Xi Jinping did not have broad international experience before he took power. Therefore, for the first 10 years, it was a learning curve for him. He would never, either he or the party, the Chinese Communist Party, would never admit his own mistakes. But the first sign came at the end of COVID. Uh, according to economist, London Economist report, uh, Premier Li Chang, opposed Xi Jinping's decision to go back to the control, and Xi Jinping gave in. Other signs were not evidenced by a report, for instance, like Economist, but by behavior of Beijing, uh, especially the foreign policy, especially foreign policy with Europe. And Xi Jinping found the former approach actually backfired, especially take Lithuanian case Therefore, I think early this year, Beijing sent a special envoy to Lithuania saying that we in China have decided to lift 
the restrictions on trade. But the cause leading up to this restriction, Beijing did not mention at all. Let it go. And that was a very clear sign of Beijing moving from wolf warrior towards charm offensive. The other signs were Beijing has lengthened the free, visa-free treatment for a growing number of countries. Another sign was Beijing's special envoy to, uh, to Europe, Fu Cong, who gave two answers to two questions concerning Ura uh, Ukraine and Russia. And the first question was that, what if Ukraine took back all the lost territories? What would you, Beijing, say? Fu Cong said, we respect their sovereignty. The other question was that, what about this friendship between China and Russia without limit? Fuzhou said that was only a uh, euphemism. There are many other signs. The other sign was that Beijing is now very active in courting Vietnam and also Mongolia. Therefore, the so same, uh, I think, rethinking, I think, has been going on on Taiwan and domestic. Thank you. So once again, thank you, Minister Lin, and thank you, Shemaine, Dr. Chan, Amanda, and Kotani San for joining us today. Um, we, will have t we have tea and coffee and some snacks out there, so please um, stay if you want to and mingle with our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>